Well, good morning. All right, welcome. Glad you are here with us, and those of you who are gonna be watching at home, if you have a Bible with you, let's grab that and open it up to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and following. Romans 11, 25, uh, verse 25 and following. So if you're just joining us, we are studying the book of Romans, and we're coming to the end of one of the major sections of the book of Romans. Really, uh, the book of Romans kind of unfolds in four parts, but there's really kind of two big ones. Uh, The first, which is chapters one through chapters 11, focus on the theology of the gospel and the application of the gospel. And then verses 12 and following is how do you live in light of the gospel. That's basically how the movements roll. So we're coming to the end of this first section of the theology of the gospel and how the gospel is applied. We've learned about words like grace and faith and mercy, righteousness, blood, how the gospel saves us has been largely what we've been looking at. But as we roll into chapter 11, Paul has been speaking about a mystery about Israel. How is it that God establishes Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, gives them the law through Moses, they are the recipients of King David, and yet they have largely, almost totally turned from the gospel of Jesus Christ, while it seems, in Paul's time, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, are flooding into the kingdom through the gospel. How is that possible? Well, Paul begins to explain it in Romans chapter 9. And he begins to explain about concepts like election and predestination, about how God uses his sovereign will to uh, push the fullness of his plan forward. So the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Israel, where where Paul is writing to this mostly Gentile church and saying, yes, right now, Israel has been cut off so that you, Gentile church, can be grafted in, so that you can be brought in. And he says, but that doesn't mean they're always going to be cut off. And in fact, he says, there's coming a time when the whole of Israel is going to come back. But what does he mean by that? And how does this end out? So to start our text this morning in in chapter 11, verse 25, I want to tell you a little secret. And here's the secret. What if I told you, I'm going to start this like a, a 30 for 30. What if I told you that there was a doctrine of the early church that the early church fathers embraced? When I say early church fathers, that means the guys who came right after the apostles, the people who wrote in the late 90s and the early 100s and the early 200s, the early church fathers, uh, we have their letters and things like that, the the beginning of the Catholic church, the reformers, Luther, Calvin, these guys, that they all embraced and put as central into understanding the Bible and how God works that is almost completely and totally ignored today. So for the first 1,700 years of the church or so, it is absolutely central in understanding theology. And today, it's almost never talked about. It's almost totally gone. Would you think, we need to know what that is? I would think you're right. And it's kind of summed up in the phrase, Deus Abscanditus. Deus Abscanditus, Latin, that means the hidden God. That God is hidden He is fundamentally hidden from us. Now, why around the 17, 1800s did Deus Abscanditus get booted, right? Well, if you've studied Western Civ, you've studied terms like the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, which had the consequence of philosophically and artistically moving humanity to the center of the universe. That what the whole world is really about What the universe is really about is us, right? Reason, we can figure out anything we want to. We are that smart. Rene Descartes, a passionate believer, uh, said, I think, therefore I am. You ever heard that before? Do you remember that phrase? I think, therefore I am. What's the problem with that? Nuh-uh. You are because God made you. You are not the center of your existence, You didn't cause it. You don't uphold it. Nothing. But the philosophy of putting ourselves central has increased the arrogance of our own capacities. Where we believe, of course I can figure out who God is. Of course I can understand who God is. 
Today, it's not uncommon to hear people say, well, I have my own religion I've made up for God. I have my own views of spirituality. This is not what the Bible teaches. This is how Christianity has never understood the spiritual realms. In fact, what the Bible teaches, in fact, what Christianity reveals to us is that we know absolutely nothing, zero things about God except what he has chosen to reveal to us. The only things we can know about God are the things to which he has revealed himself. Now, he has given us some revelations of himself that he calls the common graces, right? He says, the skies declare the glory of, his, of the Lord. The world is the work of his hand. We can look at creation and get some ideas about who God is. Romans 1 starts this idea. But really knowing who God is only comes through revelation. And that's the only way it comes. Now, why is this important? And why am I harping on this this morning? Because one of Paul's favorite phrases in all of his works, if you are a student of the New Testament, you have come across this phrase over and over and over again. But because we're on the other side of the New Testament, it doesn't punch us in the face. We don't see the fullness of it. So all of that to say, when we read verse 25, and he says this, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, we're gonna deal with the whole of this, but I just wanna start by looking at this first phrase right here. Okay, just this first phrase, because this first phrase is gonna set up how we understand the next two weeks in the book of Romans. The first thing he says, uh, I don't want you to be wise in your own sight. I don't want you to be unaware. What this literally says in Greek is, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers. I don't want you to be ignorant, unknowing. I don't want you to understand. And then he uses the word mystery. You would be shocked how many times the word mystery is used in the New Testament? Stunned, even. Because it doesn't play any relevant part in how we understand the New Testament. For the most part, when we come together, when we study, we're trying to learn something or get what's been revealed, and we don't get that this was a revelation that nobody got beforehand. Complete and total ignorance of it. Like the guys who followed Jesus around didn't understand it until the Holy Spirit showed up and went, ta-da! And even then, Jesus had to come back and teach them all the stuff. It's shrouded, closed. So when Paul says, listen, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, most of the time that Paul uses the word mystery in the New Testament, if, if you want to look this up this week, it'd be a good idea. He's saying the mystery now revealed. The mystery now revealed. What was hidden made known. Uh, what was shrouded in secrecy for the ages has now been made manifest. Over and over and over again, he hits these drums. Now, because we know what a lot of the New Testament says, it doesn't resonate with us to the people he's writing to who had no idea about these mysteries. None at all. That he's coming up and saying the things that God did that was making no sense to you, Israel, this is why he did them. And now we see why God was doing all the things he did with us for all this time. Now we see what the amazing plan of God was working through the millennia with Israel that were incomprehensible to us. Now we see the fullness of his plan. Now, I wish that we lived in a time of great uncertainty. <laughs> that we didn't know what was gonna happen next, you know, that maybe our political landscape looked unsure or our societal fabric was not, you know, was like kind of maybe unraveling in some places or maybe there was a pandemic we didn't know. You know, something that just made us a little more unsure of what's coming next. But in absence of that great teaching tool, 
I will say this. Have you ever had a time where you were unsure what's going to happen next and it kind of drove you crazy? Anybody? Is there anybody? No? Okay, everybody's good. Great, great. That's fantastic. I want you to imagine being the people of God, having been called the people of God, and have totally failed that mission have been conquered by nation after nation after nation after nation after nation. I think your fifth conquering nation now owns your capital city. The ones who have owned your capital city have brought a pig into the temple and sacrificed it on the altar just to make sure you understood how powerless you were. That your national identity is almost totally erased and yet your holy scriptures are still saying, you are my people. How do you understand that? How do you reckon with that? Well, I'll bring it even more home to you, believer, Christian believer, who have been told that you are the adopted son or daughter of God, that you are the child of the king, you are a royal priesthood. That God's own power is at work in you to will and work his good pleasure. How are you dealing with the uncertainties and the failures and the fears in your own heart? Well, they never rise up against you. The word mystery in Greek here literally means the closed mouth. You ever been praying to God's silence? His total silence and seeming abandonment? Am I re resonating with anybody? You see, I wanna do two things because I think what you think I'm going to do through this sermon is show you, it's not a mystery, it's great, woo! That's not what I'm gonna do. You're like, let's do that, let's do that. Let's, let's change tack and let's go that way. Now, what I'm going to do is show you that that is not new. In fact, to know God, to be in a relationship with God, is to fundamentally have to understand mystery and to have to be at peace with the sudden times of silence. What does he say? I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What's he saying? He's saying that Israel, that the Israel of Paul's time, as we've learned in the chapters before, have been left in their sin and God will not awaken them to the gospel. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will harden who I will harden. Partial here does not mean that every Jew is partially hardened. It means that most of Israel is hardened and some are accepting the gospel. Paul is a Jew who has accepted the gospel. Their church, the Roman church, is filled with Jews who have accepted the gospel. He means that largely we're watching Israel walk away. Why? So that the gospel will come until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That we will see the gospel spread through the Gentile lands and bring to the fullness. This is what he says in verse 26. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There's a couple things that you're gonna have to walk through this passage with. First is this. When he says all Israel will be saved, this has led some to believe that what Paul says is that every Jew from all time will be saved in Christ. That is not what Paul is saying. In fact, the last two chapters should have absolutely cemented you in that. Romans chapter nine, verse six, the section that starts this whole thing off says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. 
He's setting out that passage and what he's saying. He's saying Israel, the spiritual Israel, the elect of God is both Jew and Gentile. That the people of God are the elect of God through Jesus Christ. It is not as though the word of God has failed. Why? Because not all who have descended from Israel are Israel. So when you come back into 1126 and he says, all Israel will be saved, you understand his context of what he's saying. The gospel has to go to the Gentiles. It has to be explosive through the Gentiles so that the fullness of the Gentiles will be saved. And then he says this, and this is where this gets pretty interesting. Now this passage is from uh, Isaiah 59. The deliverer will come uh, to Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So when you're reading these kind of things, when Paul's writing them, there's all kinds of little tips and tricks you can watch. Like here, he uses Israel, right? Which is the name that Jacob is given after he wrestles with God and after God cripples him, right? He gives him this name, Israel, because he wrestled with God. But here he uses the name Jacob. He quotes from the Old Testament to mean Jacob. What's Jacob mean? Jacob is the deceiver. That's what the name Jacob means. If you're here today and your name is Jacob, you thought, my little bookmark says it means promise. It doesn't mean promise, it means liar. Welcome, Jacob, we love you, right? But watch, the, that's why he's using these two things. He's saying, look, there's Jacob and there's Israel. How does Jacob become Israel? Well, a deliverer will come. And the deliverer will banish ungodliness from him. And then he will become Israel. But let's look at the the, the passage from Isaiah 59. Because there's a lot here going through that is, is pretty cool, I think. So this is Isaiah 59, verse 19. Isaiah 59, 19. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Now, what is that saying? Right? Used to, if you're from the 80s, we sang this song, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sand, the name of the Lord will be praised. You remember that song? Some of you. From the east to the west. What's that mean? The whole world. Jew and Gentile. Everyone. This gospel is going to go everywhere. For they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives, and a redeemer will come to Zion, and those in Jacob who turn from transgression declares the Lord. Now, a couple things in Hebrew going on here that in English are not that particularly helpful. One, this word rushing. This Hebrew word is only translated as rushing one time in the whole New Testament, in the Old Testament, and it's this. This word for rushing is often is most often used in the New Testament to mean a besieging storm. A bes- like when, a, when an army would take a city and lay siege to it and surround it and capture it. The root word literally means to tie something up, to bind it, to put it in a sack. That's what this word means. So it's weird you go, what, where do they get rushing from this? And the idea is this narrow river that's been bound up that didn't go shooting out. This powerful, rushing water. If you know your Old Testament, if you know Jesus' ministry, they love this language about the Savior. Gushing streams, rushing water, all these kind of things, right? But why is it so important here? Well, it's setting up an image. It's setting up these two different images. This is how Hebrew poetry works. So he says there's this bound up stream that will come in powerfully because the wind of the Lord drives it, right? The Holy Spirit, the wind, the breath drives it and a redeemer will come to Zion. We are so used to using the word Zion in the New Testament and in the Old Testament to mean heaven and uh, the place where Jesus comes. But the word Zion in Hebrew means a desert, a dry, desolate place. That's what it means. Uh, arid, that kind of idea, arid or or dry uh, desert. So look at the the image here. It's saying a rushing stream will come to the desert. 
a rushing stream will come into the desert to those in Jacob who turn from transgression. Now you say, oh, that's good, water in the desert. Well, here's the thing, water in the desert is good and bad. You ever watch those nature shows when a, when a desert gets its one rain of the year and it's just destruction at first? I mean, it just, it just cuts through everything and just wipes out everything in its path. And then it sits for a while and then all of a sudden these seeds that have laid dormant for years bloom. You ever read the Old Testament where it says in the time of Christ, the deserts will bloom? because the dry, desolate places will explode in life again. But it would be wrong not to see this idea of a rushing stream and that idea of being besieged or tied up as being both a deliverer and a threat. A deliverer and a threat. This, this idea is not benign necessarily. There's a threat to it. There's a consequence to it. This is the rest of the passage. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forevermore. So what's Paul alluding to? He's alluding to this idea of right now, Israel looks like a desert. Israel looks like a desert. The Jewish places, because of the gospel, look like a desert. But the deliverer has come. Deliverer will come and he will bring life to the dead in a powerful way. He says, don't get bound up in this. In verse 28, he says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. You see, when Paul is writing to them, we can't forget that he's not just writing a letter to us to learn what the gospel is and how the gospel works. He's writing a letter to a church that's trying to figure out how to solve racial and theological distinctions so they can meet together. Because the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians are trying to figure out how to meet together when they're racially different, they're culturally different. They've got all kinds of different ideas. And Paul is saying, right now, Gentiles, you're right. Israel is largely neglecting the gospel. And right now, they are regarded as enemies, but there are those among them who are elect and are beloved because of the promises that God made to the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As regards the gospels, they are enemies for your sake. You cannot go long into the Bible without having to learn a lesson that sometimes that things that look horrible to our eyes are done for God's good. You can't get past the story of Joseph. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. You can't get past the story of Job. Have you really ever read the story of Job? Or do you just know the Sunday school version? His children killed, everything taken, his health taken, his wife and his best friends telling him to curse God and go ahead and die, and him saying, I will see my savior in the land of the living. It's a mystery some to, us, to us sometimes that what we see as wrong or bad, what we see as God, how could you? Is God saying, be patient and watch and wait. When we come to passages about election and predestination, automatically we rear up and go, that's not right, that's not good, that can't be right, that can't be what God is saying. Instead of going, wait. Why don't I just wait and trust the God who came to die on the cross for me? 
why don't I wait and see what his plan is? Why don't I trust the character of the God I know instead of what my assumptions about his actions are? Paul is trying to tell them, yes, the mystery of Christ has been revealed. But the mysteries of who God is and what God is doing and how God is working still remain. Paul would write in one of his letters that we in this life look through a glass darkly. He's saying you still don't know all the things God is doing and working on. And you won't until that day of Christ comes. He says for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God's promises and purposes are the prime factors in what God does. He is not leaving us on our own. He's not abandoning us. When we run into mystery with who God is and what God does, we are in the same place that the people of God have been in forever. Look, what is God's purpose in creation? The praise of his glory. The praise of his glory is God's purpose in creation. Any other metric is going to get you way off base. How has God said that you and I will, be, uh, will intersect the praise of his glory? He says, my people will be called righteous by faith. Faith will be how they praise my glory. And what is faith? Faith is the evidence of things unseen, things hoped for. If we are to be a people of faith, that means God can't tell us everything. Because if God tells us everything, there cannot be faith. There can only be knowledge. You cannot believe in something through faith what you already see and know everything. God says your joy and your pleasure and your good will be wrapped up in my glory. And the only way that you can bring the fullness of glory to me and the fullness of your life with me is through faith. And I can't tell you everything or it's not faith. But what you can do is see who I am. Gracious and kind and merciful, patient, long-suffering, gentle. Though the seas surround you, I am with you. Though you are slain, I am the first face you'll see on the other side. He says, for just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. You see, Israel can look at its long history and say, why didn't we get it together? And one of the consequences of the covenant with Israel being broken is that the gospel came to all. And when Israel looks back and says, why didn't the gospel come to us? God will say, because I have other children I needed to bring in. And when the gospel's gone around the world and Israel awakens to the gospel, as the Old Testament and New Testament seem to both speak in harmony of a great awakening to the Savior Jesus before the end times happen, their obedience the Gentiles' obedience will, that we were shown mercy will bring them mercy so that in everything, God is praised. He says in verse 32, in a verse that can be so hard to read if you don't understand the fullness of everything that Paul has brought to this moment, he says, for he has consigned all to obedience, disobedience so that he may have mercy on all. Now, he does not mean every person. This is not universalism. He means this. 
that God has made sure every person in every place and every time has become guilty of sin. Through the revelations that he's put into the world or through the law, that no one is righteous. And so that everyone who comes to him comes to him through mercy because you can't earn it. You cannot earn your way to God. The only way that he will save you is through mercy. And if it's through mercy, it's guaranteed. It can't be lost if you didn't earn it. If it's granted as a gift of mercy, if God looks at our sins and says, I am not going to punish you, then what could we lose? You cannot lose what you didn't earn. That God was setting up a salvation by grace and mercy was completely, completely hidden from ancient Israel as they brought sacrifices to the temple, as they tried to show how righteous they could be. But as we saw last week with RD teaching, as some would say, but I have kept for myself those people of faith. There's a wonderful place in one of the gospels where an old woman is shown who Jesus is and an old prophet who was promised, you will see the deliverer, gets to see Jesus. Millennia of mystery opened up in a moment. Jesus is, the revelation of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ to us has become old hat. I don't mean we we don't love it. I don't mean we don't treasure it. I mean we assume its revelations instead of marveling at them. And what I want to say to you today is this. If the revelation of Jesus from the law and sacrifice and sin and cleanness and uncleanness was joy and mercy and grace and glory, what is the mysteries that we don't know yet going to be. If the revelation from Judaism was grace and mercy and blood and forgiveness and adoption, what are the mysteries we don't know yet going to be? But heaven and kingdom and life, sinlessness, perfection, that we can't see them all just means we are the last in the line of a people who had to trust a God whose fundamental message is trust me. Believe in me. And I beg you not to let the arrogance and foolish, sinful idolatry of our own abilities and minds to keep you from the glory of revelation. This is a mystery. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and called us to be his people. The gospel of grace. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Our Father and God, As we close our time together, I pray you show us you delight in no destruction and yet you carry it out perfectly. You do not delight in wrath and yet you do it perfectly. You will allow no sin to be unpunished before you. You will allow no transgression to escape your eyes. You are holy, without blemish, without spot and without stain. And yet you have revealed to your servants and to us, you say, if I will absolutely do that which I do not delight in, how much more will I do what I delight in? The book of Romans says, if their disobedience led to the gospel, what will our obedience lead to except life from the dead? From the dead. God, as we come 
We pray that you remember to show, or you will remember us again and again and show us Christ, our Savior King and our Lord. God, as we come to Christ, we marvel at the mystery of the ages made known. Christ our Lord, Christ our King, Christ our Savior. It's in his name that we pray these things. Amen.